Hi, and welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mary Ash, and thanks for spending some time with us today. If you enjoy our conversation series, make sure you never miss an interview by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook. And be sure to visit our website, b'naibrith.org, to learn more about our work across the globe. As the world's oldest humanitarian human rights and advocacy organization, we've been at the forefront of fighting for Israel's right to exist peacefully since before the state was established. Since 1947, we've served as an NGO accredited to the United Nations, where we continue to work tirelessly to ensure that key issues are addressed with a specific focus on the safety of Israel and the Jewish people. Now, we see the ongoing efforts to portray Israel as a racist state practicing a system of apartheid, similar to the one practiced by the infamous South African regime, as outrageous and dangerous. This terrible accusation against the Jewish state, which aims to criminalize its very existence, is not only coming from the United Nations, an organization that has already accustomed us to its type of outrageous language due to its undeniable bias against Israel, but also from global human rights organizations such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. Now, we cannot remain silent in the face of these very serious and libelous attacks, and that's why we decided to convene a group of renowned international law experts who use their authoritative voices to respond to these dangerous and false accusations. We've already completed the first part of a report which is now available on our website, and we have the honor today to speak with our first two contributors, Eugene Kontorovich and Thane Rosenbaum. Professor Kontorovich is a professor at George Mason's Antonin Scalia School of Law and the director of its Center for International Law in the Middle East. An expert in international and constitutional law, he has published more than 30 academic articles in leading law reviews and peer-reviewed journals. His scholarship has been cited in precedent-setting international law cases in the U.S. and abroad. Professor Rosenbaum is a law professor, legal and Middle East analyst, novelist, essayist, and distinguished university professor at Turo University, where he directs the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society. He's the author of numerous books and articles and has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, CNN, and The Daily Beast, among other publications. He's also a legal analyst for CBS News Radio. Eugene, Thane, thank you so much for being with us today. Happy to be here, Dan. I'd also like to welcome Adriana Commissar, our special advisor on Latin American and UN affairs, who will conduct the interview with me. Adriana, thank you for joining us today as well. Pleasure. So the first question goes to Eugene. You mentioned in the report titled, Israel Apartheid is the New Zionism Equals Racism, that the baseless comparisons between Israel and the apartheid South African regime are not new, and note the infamous 1975 United Nations General Assembly resolution that stated Zionism was a form of racism. This resolution, by the way, was approved by the United Nations only 30 years after the Holocaust. The truth is that we're used to expecting this type of outrageous allegation from the United Nations, but we now see major global human rights organizations making the same claims. Why do you think this is happening? Um, so the, I think it's happening for a number of reasons. And some, some of those reasons I think are um, so good reasons, or that is to say uh, encouraging reasons. Uh, you can see this from uh, the rhetoric uh, and, let's say, the publicity campaigns surrounding the release of the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International reports. Uh, it's clear they were aiming for headlines because they would say, for the first time ever, Human Rights Watch says Israel is an apartheid state. They've said it in various ways before. Something really new. Now we're saying Israel is an apartheid state. And as, as I show in my paper, as we just discussed, there's nothing new about this, right? As a matter of fact, like many other forms of anti-Semitism, it's hard to uh, come up with something new. It's all We've seen it all before. And in particular, this was the 1975 Zionism is Racism Resolution specifically talks about Israel's like 
imperialist uh, racist South Africa. And of course, there were hardly any settlements at the time. It wasn't about the West Bank. It was about the idea that the idea of a Jewish state is illegitimate and they compare it to South Africa. So we know it's not new. So they're, you, they're, they're trying to get some attention to um, accusations against Israel. And I think, so the good news, I'll tell you the good news. The good news is it shows that a lot of other rhetoric that has been used to attempt to demonize and single out Israel and make Israel beyond the pale hasn't worked, right? So for a long time, they were talking for a long time about Israeli human rights abuses. And um, nobody believes that story anymore. Um, they were talking a lot about the occupation. And people say this is Jews living in communities. Palestinians numerous times had an opportunity to choose to end the occupation, to choose a state. And the Palestinian refusal to do so has made people tired, I think, also of the occupation narrative. So they need to turn up the rhetoric. And it's very hard for them to do because they're already maxed out. And... Uh, you know, I hope I won't be frivolous to, to say, say it. it's like Spinal Tap. You know, in the movie Spinal Tap, when you have the heavy metal band and then, like, <laughs> the car is turned up to 10, right? Where, like, if you're already rocking out at 10, where else can you go? You need to add 11. There's no 11. It's a guitar volume goes up to 10. Add an 11. So <laughs> these groups could not be more anti Israel um, if they tried, but so they need to add something at the end of the dial. And apartheid is, is, is that thing. And in the sense that the apartheid allegation is so easily refutable. It's so clear there's no separation in Israel of any population. Arabs have political rights. There's an Arab judge, a Muslim Arab, first became the first Muslim judge on uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, and every day Israelis uh, you know, open up the news or go on Twitter to see, is the Muslim Brotherhood going to stay in the government or not stay in the government? Israel being the only country in the Middle East that has a Muslim Brotherhood party in the government rather than in in the in the secret police cells, so uh, j jails. So why why make an accusation so easy to refute? In a sense, it's it's a sign of desperation. On the other hand, it's also something about our media and cultural environment. Uh, nobody's going to read long articles about this. But right? what matters now is just headlines, is just tweets, and in this and we know we all live in an increasingly polarized political environment. And in that kind of environment, you need to make the most inflammatory accusations possible because people aren't going to really read it. They're not going to figure out. They're not going to listen to the explanations. So this is the idea that's very popular in media studies now of the Overton window. The Overton window is the, the uh, parameters of acceptable argument. And by making a very extreme argument, they're in a sense shifting the parameters of what can be said. And most observers are going to think, you know, that um, the truth is somewhere in the middle. So by make, so so in, to get observers to adopt extreme views, you need to make the most extreme claims. We see this in our politics and um, they're, you know, they're, they're just, uh, they're, 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 they're just mirroring it. I'll say one more final thing um, about why. Again, I'm not, you know, sitting there with Amnesty International um, at their um, at their meetings, but I think it's important, first of all, so I don't want to over psychoanalyze them. So the best thing to do is to say what they said. So the American director of Amnesty International said, we don't believe, speaking to a, um, a sympathetic crowd after, said, uh, we don't believe Israel should exist as a Jewish state. We're against the idea of a Jewish state. We're against the idea of a Jewish state. Uh, guess what? That's Zionism is racism. So they are seeking to abolish Israel in the form that it was created in 1948, and they have made their agenda abundantly clear. Yes, um, I'd like to ask a question to Payne. Um, one of the most important points that you make in your essay titled The Terrorism of Untruths is that, and I'll quote you, the wars that Arab nations and Palestinian terrorists have been unable to win against Israel have opened up into a new theater a war of defamatory words, anti-Semitic semantics, the semiotic of Palestinian suffering. Could you elaborate on this? Well, you know, it is obvious. Well, first of all, again, thanks for inviting Gene and uh, myself. And I, 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 I will not be able to beat Gene's Spinal Tap reference. That was classic, uh, totally appropriate. And I didn't even know he was old enough to know that movie. Um, um, <laughs> Eleven. Uh, yes, Adriana, I, um, 
it is obvious that, uh, you know, Israel has won a number of wars and its military capability has only enhanced, enhanced to the point where Persian Gulf nations signed in Abraham Accords in part because they know the regional superpower in, in the Middle East uh, and North Africa and the Persian Gulf is Israel. So th- I think everyone, especially uh, Palestinian sympathizers, are given up on the thought that this can be done by force. So what we saw initially in 1948, where, you know, r- r- encouraging Palestinians to flee their homes uh, because we'll take care of the Israelis militarily. Nobody believes that anymore. <laughs> nobody believes that Israel wouldn't be able to defeat Iran on its own. So they had to get to a different theater of war. And the one theater war that I think has worked even before apartheid, and and I am becoming I am becoming increasingly more critical of this as I've gotten older, is the war on language. Some of it, I think, Israel is responsible uh, for allowing it to go on as long as it did, and not tr- and not creating the kind of iron dome defense that they have when it comes to you know errant rockets. From Gaza, which is that, for instance, the denial of the right to exist, right? This idea that this is being said, as Gene pointed out, you know, since 19, you know, from the very beginning, when it's not being said about any other country, just one, right? So that it's this idea that, you know, even the the early uh, peace proposal was, and you will finally agree that we have a right to exist. This is ridiculous, Right. I don't even talk to people who don't believe I exist. I don't I don't do anything with you. If that's if that is a negotiating point. Right. On the entire planet, you have one country that doesn't exist. Every other one exists. But me. Right. And and so this idea that this was even a negotiating point instead of what it was, was a moral outrage from the very beginning. I have become increasingly because I've just become you know, uh, in, uh, I've just become disgusted with Palestinian uh, intransigence, uh, uh, glorification of violence, uh, their uh, rejectionism. That th- I think that the capitulation on the word occupation, giant mistake, big step. I don't use it anymore. Uh, unfortunately, there's too much early Thane Rosenbaum writing in which I use the word occupation. It's nonsense. It was never an occupation. Uh, Gene has written very eloquently about this and 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 I and in some ways influenced me, you know, th- th- on the idea that, uh, you know, uh, if anyone has the best legal title, everyone's got not tremendous legal title. But if, any, if is there any country that's got best legal title to the West Bank and Gaza, <laughs> it's Israel. So the idea that uh, this post Oslo accommodation where everyone, especially in Israel, and they still do refer to the word occupation. If you mess around with language, if words don't have common meaning, moral meaning that are f- grounded in moral truths, I- historical and moral truths, then you get this next wave. You get something called apartheid which is the absurdity of it. It doesn't belong in any conversation associated with Israel. Ethnic cleansing. You know, I've been a human rights law professor for 30 years. I speak around the world. One of the things I always say is genocide is pretty clear. If you speak to the Congolese, the Rwandans, the Armenians, uh, the Cambodians, and of course the Jews, at the end of a genocide, you have to have fewer people living than, than, than there were before. You have to have fewer people. Six million has its own term of art for Jews. 800,000 has its own term of heart uh, for Rwandans, right? A million for Armenians, right? The Palestinian population has more than doubled since the, quote, occupation. Why are we using words like ethnic cleansing? people do not get to use the word genocide if there are more people alive today than when the genocide purportedly happened. And so again, again, unique to Israel alone, you see this sort of laziness when it comes to language. And it does seem 
that Israel's enemies have recognized that the war of words and the war of libels is something they can win. If it comes to fighting off the IDF, they can. But what I'm pointing out is that apartheid, it falls into a category of a number of other words that were always misapplied, that should never have been accepted. And Israel continues to have to fight these words. And apartheid is now in particular with these two new reports, the new word. Oh, and I would just lastly say, you know, do not underestimate the uh, George Floyd factor here in the United States. Black Lives Matter. It's true around the world. The word racism today, right? Associating yourself with racism, as you see in our political culture in the United States, everyone is called a racist. It could be, you could do anything and you're called a racist. So given the centrality of this word racism, you can see why Human Rights Watch and International Amnesty International have said, you know where we really got to go? We got to show racism because people are really stupid. They've been told we have a United States president who continues to say the word systemic racism. He doesn't know what it means. He really doesn't. And people use these words very casually. And I can say as a law professor, there is racism in the United States, uh, but there's no systemic racism. But it doesn't matter. People will keep saying it. And I fear that you're seeing this with the apartheid report as well. It's cynical and deliberate. Use the word racism, associate it with Jews, and everyone will come along. Well, Zane, let me pick up on, on words and definitions. Uh, another important point that you make uh, is that uh, the reports from Amnesty and Human Rights Watch use the word apartheid even when the basic elements yeah. of the legal definition of apartheid are not met. Now, uh, clearly, uh, you're a professor of human rights law. Uh, clearly, there are uh, there are attorneys somewhere in those organizations. <laughs> you you would think who would who would vet the use of words, but yet uh, this is what they're doing. So it's it's kind of like casual throwing out. I think both of you have, have made that uh, that point. But um, the legal definition seems to have been lost somewhere um, in in the background. The real legal well, definition. Well, Dan, I, I don't know if I can answer this or you want Gene answer, but I would simply say it's, again, not dissimilar to what we're seeing in the United States. I think that international, inter, inter, uh, Amnesty International and Human Rights uh, Commission have uh, picked up, you know, they've, they're, what's the word, free riding. They're free riding on the focus on racism uh, in the United States. So, for instance, they're, they know, they went to law school, they know that the Palestinians are not a race. They're a, they're a people, they're a nation, they're an ethnicity, but they're not a race. So to say the word racism applied to a people that are not a race, well, they go, well, maybe they're not a race, but we can use their ethnicity in the same category. Well, not lawyers don't do that, right? <laughs> That's not what they're supposed to do. You don't just fudge, well, you're not exactly a race. And similarly saying, well, there's no, Gene makes this point repeatedly too. Well, there's no actual separation. Yeah, that's right. There's not. Uh, uh, in, in Israel, Arabs and Jews ride public accommodations, public transportation, sit in the same restaurants, sit together in rock concerts. Uh, you know, there's no actual separation or, or systematic oppression and separation that you is required for the definition of, of apartheid. It doesn't exist. So they've come up with something that I think is very similar to what you see in the United States, which means inequality. <laughs> if you see inequality, then, it, then you can just add everything to it. And so that's what they're also saying. Talk about bastardizing the word. And they're saying, well, you may be right. There's no separation and they're not really a race. But if there's inequity between Jews and Arabs it can only mean one thing, Jews are racists. It can't be anything else. And it's, by the way, notice it is exactly the argument that's being used in the United States. If there is any inequality or any disparity between the races, it can't have anything to do with anything else. It's not about hard work. It's not about effort. It's not about intact families. It's not about anything but race. It's the only reason 
for inequality. And that's exactly what's going on in this report. They're completely ignoring the legal definition. And they're saying, well, as long as there's inequality between the Jews and Arabs, Israel must be racist. And therefore, it's an apartheid state. Can you just add something to... to sure. I, I, I want to just point out why it's important to talk about the legal definition. Uh, the legal definition is important uh, to point out, and I, I want to also offer a thought about do they have lawyers in these uh, organizations. Um, I want to make a... Thane isn't suggesting that like Israel's doing something like apartheid, but you know they get off on a technicality. Now, the, <laughs> apartheid has a very long definition of which... None of the aspects match up, not a single one. But the definition is long and complicated to show how extraordinary a crime apartheid is. And uh, how extraordinary is it? So far, the international community and these organizations have only deemed one country in the whole history of human badness to be an apartheid country, namely South Africa. Not China with the uh, sterilization of the Uyghurs, not to mention Tibet, and there's so many things. Um, not Iran with their elimination of the Baha'i, essentially. None of that. So, only, so it's a high standard, and that's supposed. It's supposed to be an awesome term, like the, the worst, uh, uh, the worst accusation. But you need lawyers to make rules because rules are supposed to, are designed to apply to other cases, right? You need a definition, and you need to really think about what definition you're using if you're going to think, oh, well, how's the next case going to Do we really want to call country X, call it uh, Iran, uh, uh, which is you know only half Persian and half many other ethnic groups? Uh, do we want to call that a, a, an, apartheid, an apartheid state? They don't, they don't need lawyers because they don't need to ask that question because it's clear in everyone's mind from the beginning that this is... Uh, what um what Justice Scalia used to call a one ride ticket, right? Like a one way, good for this ride only. You tear it up afterwards, and and there were Amnesty International. I think to show this, they actually they're, they're in a they're not just engaged in sort of writing reports. They're engaged in propaganda and uh, advocacy. They took out ads in um in the UK uh, at bus stops uh, and, and tube stations, and they said like apartheid countries in the history of the world, South Africa one to Israel. So it's clear they're done. They're not interested in China. They're not interested in, they're not interested in anything, really. And so they don't really need to be careful with the definition because they're very conscious of the enterprise that they're uh, engaged in. So I think, I just want to point out, I think Thane did them too much justice <laughs> to suggest that they're conflating racism or racial inequality, racial inequality with um, apartheid, because there's more racial inequality in much of the world, including probably the United States, than in Israel, but they're not sticking the apartheid sticker on, on those. So it's racial inequality of result if you're Israel. So really, it's just, and if you're Israel does all the, all the work there. Well, um, Gina, you actually answered part of my question because it was, uh, I wanted to ask you about the methodology used by these reports to um, conclude that Israel is an apartheid state. Yes. Uh, so the methodology is very simple because, so there's a definition, you need um, various kinds of acts of murder, enslavement, oppression, etc. So they really skip that. And what they do, it's uh, what, I, what I call, you know, throw, you know throwing the... Uh, Throwing the tar the dart and you know drawing a target around it, um, they basically have a list of Israeli policies that they don't like since 1948. Many of these policies are debatable as a policy matter. For example, the nation state law was a big debate in the Israeli Knesset whether to have Hebrew as the sole official language. Most country, almost every country in the world, uh, has only one sole official language, regardless of how many minorities it has. But okay, it's a, it's a debatable. Um, it's a it's a it's a debatable thing. Um, so they take everything Israel does that they don't like. Much of these being policies that were um, only adopted in response to uh, wave, waves of terror and not for clearly any kind of purpose of domination. Um, and uh, then they say, oh, so it all adds up to apartheid. Uh, but uh, you you can tell there's no methodology because the first practices they cite is 1948, the establishment of a of a of a of a, of a, of a, of a Jewish state, um, so they see it as apartheid from birth, and thus a result. Anything they anything Israel obviously does as a Jewish state, or to secure itself, 
would be apartheid. And most notably in their methodology, they discuss the whole history of the Israel, Israeli Palestinian conflict without mentioning, without mentioning Oslo, without mentioning that Israel created a Palestinian, allowed the creation of a Palestinian government, which governs the lives of 90% of um Palestinians. Now they might say, oh, those are Bantu, like South African Bantu stands. South Africa purported to create autonomous uh, black homelands. But the difference is the international community didn't recognize those autonomous black homelands and said they're Bantu stands because they were clearly puppets. Nobody thinks Mahmoud Abbas is an Israeli puppet. He's not like reading instructions from Israel when he ha- passes the pay for slave legislation. Um, uh, allocating 7% of the Palestinian Authority budget for the, mur- the murder of Israelis when he flies around launching international prosecutions against Israel. It's clearly not a puppet. Uh, the, whatever, whatever you think of it. Uh, and it's clearly not a, a puppet state, which is why it's actually recognized by about as many countries as recognized um, as, recogni- as recognized as well, the existence of the Palestinian Authority, which governs the daily lives of 90% of Palestinians, uh, and is their, the government with which they interact, uh, pay, governs their taxes, their education, their welfare, their pensions, everything. Uh, it's just it's not mentioned in, in the report. It's as if it never happened. Um, the intifadas, as if, as if they never happened. And Israel's offer on at least four separate occasions of the creation of a state. Right? Imagine, imagine if uh, the South Africans said to Nelson Mandela, "Hey, hey, you wanna you wanna have a, a country? But some other time, I, I want more territory for him." Right? He wouldn't be the Nelson. He wouldn't be Nelson Mandela. Uh, so, so they just miss that. So the um, and then anything that Israel does, they boots. They say, "Ah, oh, that's that's uh, that's proof." And I have to say, and the list is too long, but they uh, both they both distort facts and they also um, invent. Uh, a fair, uh, a fair number. I think that's a short description of the methodology. Can, can so I just add to, something? Uh, to comment. The, Go ahead. Sure. I sure. just want to add something quickly to the Abbas uh, anecdote that Jean uh, just discussed, which is that that there may have even been a, even a more cynical reason not to talk about the Palestinian Authority, because if you talk about the Palestinian Authority, you realize that Abbas is now what in the fourteenth year of a four-year term. Right. So if you focus on the Palestinian Authority, it's not just that the international community recognized the creation of a governmental unit that would supervise and and play the role of a government for the West Bank Palestinians. But then you have to get around, oh, my God, they're not a democracy. They don't have they don't recognize the rule of law. They don't have democratic institutions. They don't accept liberal values. And so and they hate that, that Israel can point to that. They hate that, that guys like Gene and Fane Rosenbaum can point to that. And so here they are, Amnesty International. They're reluctant. Yes, they're the 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 paper, the their report is filled with utter you know, lies and bad faith. Yes. But there's even more strategic reasons to leave some information out because the good news is ultimately bad news because it demonstrates, again, why don't we talk about the five rejected offers for statehood? Well, because then it makes you realize that statehood isn't what they're interested in. What they're interested in is dead Jews. And they can't acknowledge that. Why would Amnesty International say, Yes, this is about let's kill some more Jews. So the idea is to if they credit the peace offers, then they have a problem to have to try to explain that, you know, how are how are Jews racist? How are Jews interested in a separation if they've made peace proposals? And yes, how laughable that would be if you said to a black Afrikaner, how many times did the the white population offer you a country? I mean, they would look at you again. All of these things are an insult to the nations that ultimately experience these abuses and oppressions, the ethnic cleansing charge and, of course, the apartheid as well. Then just uh, to go back, I think it was uh, Gene who who referenced uh, Paul O'Brien, the uh, Amnesty International USA director, uh, saying uh, in March that um, he's opposed to the idea that Israel should be preserved as a state for the Jewish people. No, I think it was uh, Nathan Sharansky years ago already who said, you know, people are beginning to say, people, academics, uh, uh, NGOs, 
uh, in the human rights field were beginning to say, well, maybe the creation of Israel was a, you know, a big mistake. Do you, this story, the Paul O'Brien story, was, was a two-day story, and people kind of dismissed it. Is this the direction we're going in? So we've gone from, as, as you've said, we've gone from human rights abuses to the word occupation. Now we're at apartheid. Now we've got Paul O'Brien saying, well, this whole thing is just, just a mistake. I'm against it. Uh, where, where is that? Where does that lead? Well, you, you're right, Dan. What you're seeing now, I think, is more honesty, you know, about what their intentions are. The intentions is to say, remember, most of the states in the United Nations were the, emerged after World War II as part of the decolonization of the word, world. I think two thirds of the countries in the United Nations were created just the way Israel was that a major Western power used to be here. And then there were partitions and we carved things up, right? So when we talk about Israel, it's again, using the language settler colonial enterprise, right? There's a fancy term of art to say what? Well, what does that say? Jews from Los Angeles and London and Brooklyn went down to a country that they have no connection to called Israel and they stole Arab land. That's the story, right? Jews have no, that's why UNESCO spent so much time denying the biblical connection, the historic connection, Jews to this ancestral homeland. The story that they like to tell in order to say that this is a colonial enterprise is to say white people stole land from people of color, right? People went white people that have no business being there, right? The fact that more, most Israelis are actually people of color, very inconvenient truth. They're, it just so happens Mizrahi Sephardic Jews are people of color. It doesn't fit the story of Brooklyn invaders, Los Angeles invaders, Amsterdam invaders, white, very, 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 very white people stole land from dark, dark, dark people. And again, it fits into this broader issue of racism and colonialism. So one idea is to think about, well, you know, there's another word that gets used, settler colonialism, when in fact, if you really don't like Israel as a colonial enterprise, then you really need to give the country back to the British. You don't give it back to the Palestinians because there never was a Palestinian nation run by Arabs. There, were, there was a Palestinian nation run by Jews. It was called Judea, and there were, they had a King David and a King Solomon, right? But Arabs have never had control in any nationalistic way, governmental way, of that region. So to decolonize means, oh, you mean you want to bring it back for... But that's not how people understand it. They understand it as Israel stole a country from an Arab country. But there was never an Arab country in Palestine or in Gaza, not since the Philistines, at least in Gaza. So this argument of legitimacy is, is this new wave that's becoming accepted, where you're really saying it's, it's a colonial enterprise, so therefore it's racist. And it was illegitimate from its beginnings because it required the stealing of land that belonged to others. But as I said before, if you're making that argument about Israel, you have to knock out two thirds of the UN. You have to basically say to all the countries, all of your countries are really on probation. It's provisional. We really got to take another look at that. Because remember, Israel was voted upon in the United Nations, right? It was created, the concept of a partition for Israel was created during the League of Nations with the, the codification of the San Remo Conference and the Treaty of Sevres. This is stuff that Gene knows way better than anyone on the planet, but and he can explain this better. But you, know, you can make this legal argument, very strong scholarly argument, that you know, Israel has been, has been accepted under international law. This didn't just start with Amnesty International yesterday. This has been going on from the end of World War I, that you started to see the legal architecture for the creation of a Jewish state. So for now, they have to see these anti-Semitic enterprises, Amnesty International, Human Rights Commission, 
saying, counsel saying, uh, you know, this was never legitimate. You have in order to make that claim, you have to ask, they have to, they have to make the case. Well, you mean nothing was legitimate? The League of Nations, that enterprise, the San Remo resolution was not, uh, the United Nations voting on Israel. Uh, I think that was resolution 181. None of that applies. It applies to all the other countries that were created after World War II when we decolonized so much of that part of the world. But one country is illegitimate and all the others are legitimate. Adriana. Um, yes. Um, well, uh, then I'd like to ask uh, Eugene, um, he, he mentioned something about that, um, but he makes a critically important point in, in his essay about um, that the reports ignore the Oslo Accords, and most importantly, that they ignore the apartheid-like policies of the Palestinian Authority and the rulers of, of Gaza. Maybe he can tell us more about that. Uh, I think Palestinian apartheid is an important thing to speak about, because if you need further proof of the agenda-driven nature of these reports, they're looking at the area between the river and the sea, the area which is together controlled by Israel and the Palestinian Authority, and they're looking for apartheid. And so if you look at any area under Israeli control, Israel area C of the West Bank, you will see both Arabs and Jews live there. Both Arabs and Jews can go to the same shopping centers, sit at the same cafe, sit at the same cafe. Mm -hmm. Then go 100 meters over to the areas under the control of the Palestinian Authority, areas A and B of the West Bank, um, almost 90% of the city of Hebron, uh, and, and the Gaza Strip. And uh, where are the Jews then? Where are the Jews? There actually, there are no Jews. Now, given that an apartment in Jerusalem costs millions of shekels, the fact that like you don't have a single Jew buying an apartment in Ramallah, which is 10 minutes away, it, it requires explanation. It's not just because. And we know it's not, you know, people say, oh, well, Jews wouldn't want to live in an Arab-controlled place. That is absolutely not true. In the United Arab Emirates, in Bahrain, even in Saudi Arabia, there's Jews um, where their security can be, uh, can be guaranteed. But the Palestinian Authority has policies of what's apartheid mean? Actually creating apartness, the peoples, races separated. And the Palestinian Authority actually has rules exactly like that. Jews can't buy land. Palestinians have the death penalty for selling land to Jews. Jews don't have real estate rights. Uh, Jews can't worship. There's uh, a list of a dozen holy, Jewish holy sites under exclusive Palestinian control, which under the Oslo Accords, uh, Jews are guaranteed, and under basic international human rights law, guaranteed free access and free worship. Uh, Jews don't pray at any of those sites, except occasionally they sneak in in the middle of, uh, in the middle of the night under armed guard. Jews don't have freedom of religion, right? So, um, and of course, Jews are erased, both physically, physical erasure, through the pay for slay program, where uh, funds the extrajudicial execution, of uh, uh, of Jews and of course hi historically and culturally erased, uh, they are creating a complete Jew-free zone where Jews don't don't exist in the present and they don't exist in history. That is, it's pure. The South Africans, by the the the, Af the South African regime, did not go that far, right, of erasing blacks from African history. They just stuck with the present. So they're erasing from the present and the uh, 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 and 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 from the past. There's no Jews. And Muhammad Abbas has said he will not accept Palestinian state with a single Jew living there. Not a single Jew. Um, Palestinian president has described the um, the uh, the uh, ban on selling land uh, uh, to, to Jews as being like the holy of holies of their uh, legislation. A fund that's not just a real estate rule. It's a fundamental national principle. Um, okay, now do those policies amount to apartheid? Maybe, maybe not. That's a, that, that's a, but there is a legal definition, and that definition is very demanding, right? But it it's a lot closer. It begs analysis. Not a single one of those things is mentioned in this report. So you know, this is uh, uh, this is like uh, the drunken man looking for his keys under the lamp post because that's uh, that's where the light is. They they know where they want to look, uh, and even if it's not where they're going to where they're going to find. 
And there's no excuse for this, except obviously this is an operation to create Israel. They don't, and the proof is that they don't mention any of this. So maybe there is what to talk about on the apartheid front. And I think I think the apartheid-like nature of these Palestinian policies are not talked about um, sufficiently, in a sense, uh, too many, you know, because, and a part of it is because uh, I think um, people who are not afraid to speak out uh, in defense of Israel, they're always on the defensive. They're just trying to show that, like, Israel's not a horrible, monstrous country, so they don't really have the bandwidth to talk about, uh, you know, the fact that a Jew would get killed for buying a house, uh, an Arab would, get, or Arab would get killed for selling a house in Jerusalem. To, uh, uh, to a Jew, but I think we need to pay much more attention to that, in part because, of course, Arabs are the victims also of these policies. Palestinians are the victims. And, and it's not just that the report doesn't acknowledge what Gene said, which is, you know, there is no, con- there is no contemplation in any uh, framework for a uh, Palestinian country uh, in the Middle East where Jews would be allowed to live. It's not just that. It's that the report also doesn't say, oh, by the way, 20% of Israel is made up of Arab Palestinians, just to show you the contrast. It's not just that one country would make it Jew-free, right? You could not be a Jew and live in any country called Palestine. So if you're going to give the Palestinians country, you have to recognize that it's not going to be a place that Jews can live, and it's going to be a place where homosexuals will, will be torched and thrown off buildings. Where are where's the progressive outrage about that? And where are the feminists? Where women could very easily be stoned, beheaded, will be held to be illiterate, they won't be able to learn to read. You know, any number of things that you would see under certainly strict Muslim Brotherhood Sharia law adherence. But it's it's this other thing that is just so intellectually gross to say, oh, and by the way, if you go into Israel, you'll notice that there are Palestinian Arabs who are on the Supreme Court and who are, uh, you know, sitting on the same bus with Jews and in restaurants uh, and serving in the government, in the co, not just in the government in the Knesset, but in the coalition itself this time you have arab countries so this is this is like the most inconvenient truth that does not appear in the report and if you want to talk about intellectual dishonesty you add what gene just said which is you're talking about this is beyond apartheid jews wouldn't be allowed to live in any arab country called palestine but arabs can yes is there racism against arabs in, in Israel, yes, just like there's racism here in the United States against African Americans, but there are civil liberties and there are equal rights and there's the opportunity. I mean, look, the one of the things about apartheid that is most outrageous is that it wasn't more than a few years ago that Israel crowned a Miss Israel who was Ethiopian. This, this looks to you like apartheid? They, a, a woman of dark skin, not as Mizrahi skin, Ethiopian skin, is Miss Israel with pride? That's Miss Israel? And you, you, you have the audacity to use the words apartheid? If I were a South African black person, I would be outraged. I can't even imagine th- this idea that we could have had a Miss South Africa who is black at some point competing in an international competition. So it's much worse that they they don't explain what would happen in a Palestine. They just leave out the most crucial elements of pluralism and Israel's democratic institutions that completely undermine or undercut all of these arguments about evil evil Israel. Gene, this is what we're what we're really talking about here. Really, is uh, anti-Zionism. If we roll all of this up. All that we discussed here. On this on this program today, this this can be all put together under the under the rubric of, of anti-Zionism. How do we begin uh, to push back? Because the sense here, this is this is a, a perfect storm, and I, I'd, I'd like both of you to respond to this. I mean, you've got uh, Michael Link, um, the outgoing UN Special Rapporteur on um, the situation of human rights in the Palestinian territories, uh, issued a report the UN Human Rights Council accusing Israel the crime of apartheid uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, Link, 
of course, has a long history of anti-Israel activity. Uh, it's probably, not probably, most likely he got the position for this. You, you have to have qualifications in order uh, to be in this kind of hostile uh, position against Israel. So we have the report by link. Um, we have um, the upcoming report of the Commission of Inquiry, and I know that Adriana would like to, to talk about that in a moment. And these incendiary reports from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty. So we have a perfect storm uh, being formed here against Israel. Um, what what are the what are the suggestions here uh, to push back? Because it's coming from every place we look. We've got it on campus. We've got it in the United Nations. Uh, we've got it uh, from various governments. Uh, everywhere we look. So, what what are the answers uh, to uh, to not only rebutting uh, but turning this tide back? So, uh, Gene, let's start with you and then Thane. I think there's different answers in uh, different fora. So, for example, the United Nations, nothing actually um, happens there, and uh, I think you know, in, in a sense, these reports are a bit like voodoo. Uh, the more you believe in it, the more it works. So, I think Israel needs to just keep its cool. Uh, keep on going. And, uh, you know, in 1975, when they first made the apartheid accusation, Israel's position was so much more precarious. It was 1975. America had just lost Vietnam. Soviet Union was taking, uh, 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 taking over everywhere. And this was a Soviet resolution. And things looked very bad. Uh, we survived that, um, survived some more uh, UN, uh, UN resolutions. Um, we uh, just need to, uh, you know, keep cool. Uh, campus is a bit of a different challenge because I think the apartheid um, allegation is used to uh, intimidate Jewish students, uh, to uh, discredit um, pro-Israel causes, and to sort of impact the uh, educational formative experiences of um, many young Americans. Um, the problem is, uh, and uh, Thane alluded to this earlier, Israel's uh, sort of response of Israel's um, I just want to tell the truth about Israel, is often, um, is, you know, is not going to be, I think, the, the solution. Because they say Israel's an apartheid state. Israel's defenders will say, no, it's not an apartheid state. Yes, there's racism, there's other problems, it's not a perfect country. What do people hear? Israel's between imperfect and apartheid, so let's call it like quasi-apartheid, <laughs> very bad. And, but whatever you're talking about, you're talking about why Israel is or is not an apartheid state. So the um, the people will it creates a mental association. I believe that's one of the tactical goals of this movement on campus. They're not going to convince people, everyone you know who think about it, that Israel is an actual apartheid state. But you walk by and you like you just see on the quads how many people actually stop and you know look at the literature uh, that they're giving out. Israel apartheid it creates some kind of negative association. Um, and uh, simply uh, rebutting it is going to be is necessary. I think it's necessary to rebut that, but it, it is it is um, not adequate. And I think I think it's important to shift the discussion to the to to real human rights abuses um, because you know in a sense you're wasting your breath talking about why or why. You know, let me put it this way: I liken the apartheid accusation to a, a blood libel in many ways. I have a lecture I give about it: modern blood libels. Um, you know, it's wild, it's crazy, you know, blood libel, the claim of uh, the use of Christian babies' blood and matzah, it's wild in uh, many ways. But if someone says, hey, Jews, you know, you're using uh, Christian babies' blood to make matzah, you don't say, no, it has an OU certificate, non gebrach <laughs> we can guarantee you, kosher to the highest standard, the Hasidim will eat it, no, no, um, the, that's not a, that's not a response, right, that you don't argue the facts with a, with a, a, a blood libel. You don't say, look, really, like in halacha, blood is very unkosher. Um, the, that, that's the wrong response. But that's often what our response about, you know, when, and I'm, I've done this myself, I'm not blaming anyone, when it's like, apartheid, wait, we have a Supreme Court justice and we uh, have the uh, acting president of Israel and the army officers and the generals. It's a little bit like uh, pointing to the Heksha when uh, the kosher certification in response to a, a blood libel. Because we need to be talking about Palestinian apartheid. And on campus, um, and I was happy to um, have been a bit involved in this, for the first time this year, um, a campus group, Students Supporting Israel, had Palestinian apartheid week, uh, uh, events on several campuses. And I think that's crucial to beginning to establish the truth. Fane, would you like to comment on that? And then we'll go to yeah, Adriana. I would say, um, just briefly, 
Um, two things. One is, and this is something that, you know, is a B'nai B'rith moral imperative in my view, which is a radicalized, very, very aggressive public education campaign for Jews. What Gene and I are talking about is just, you know, it's as if we're, we're talking Talmud for most Jews on the planet. They, they don't know anything. You know, they know how to renovate a kitchen. Uh, they know how to get their kids into dental school. They know certain things. But virtually nothing that Gene and I said tonight is widely known by, by anybody, even people who purport to know stuff and read, but they don't know. I mean, they would be shocked. I, I hope if they're watching, they're taking notes. So because they just, that's not to mean that I think that rebutting the charge is going to make a difference. That was the point Gene's making. And I agree. Saying, you know, if someone wants to call you, if you, you're a dirty Jew, you're a dirty Jew. And they don't use that word anymore. They use apartheid. You know, they say uh, ethnic cleansers. You know, they don't use the word dirty. This is anti-Semitism, right? And so that's what this is really about. It is a, a way, you know, the Palestinians conveniently created an, a, a, a wonderful opportunity to legitimize anti-Semitism by dressing it up in, in, a, in a human rights issue. Now we get to say dirty Jew, but we can do it without using the word dirty Jew because we're much more sophisticated people now. We're not some peasants from Ukraine and Poland. We have to come up with a better way to hate Jews. So let's do it this way. Let's undermine their state. Let's call them land grabbers. They steal land and they're, uh, they're, they're murderers, blood libel. Another one, blood, the, they're murderers of Palestinian people with ethnic cleansing. Again, a population that has doubled somehow is an object of, of, uh, of genocide. And, and they're, they're an apartheid state. But at least, even if it doesn't work, Jews should be at the ready to rebut. Whether it works or not, I don't know. If you're talking to someone who hates you, they hate you. You're not going to you're not going to out convince out talk them of it or convince them of it. The second thing, and I just briefly, this is very important, and Gene knows this from university life with Title VI, which is the International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism which 28 states have approved, including the United States State Department, which is now you're starting to see some pushback. You're going to see this at Harvard. You're seeing this at Duke, at University of North Carolina, at Princeton, where when they stumble into this, Jews don't have a right to exist as a self-determined nation. Uh, Jews are held to a higher standard, as Gene said, all the other human rights abusers around the world, we have no tables with literature about them. None. We're not interested in all of those real human rights. We're only interested in one state. And the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance makes several points about what is anti-Semitism. And Israel and in American Jews should be insisting that that definition be applied. And if you're receiving government funds, we are stripping you of government funds because you are an anti-Semite and you're and, and the government doesn't give money to anti-Semites. And what you, the, the, the two key points are denying the self-determination of the Jewish people to their own homeland is anti-Semitism. Well, Gene already quoted the executive director of International uh, Amnesty International, who said, I don't believe that there should be a Jewish homeland. Well, According to the definition that 28 states have adopted, that guy, O'Brien, is a Jew-hating anti-Semite. And everywhere he walks, someone should say, there, there goes a Jew-hating anti-Semite, according to the definition of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And the other part that's another category in the definition is holding Israel to a standard that is not being applied to any other nation. That's the point that Gene has made repeatedly. And so the fact is that if you don't have any other tables on campus about apartheid regimes and ethnic cleansing, and you only have one table, and it happens to be about Jews and their, their the self-determination and their ancestral homeland, in the one liberal democracy in the Middle East, then clearly you're violating that definition of anti-Semitism, you are engaged in anti-Semitism and you should be stripped of federal funding. Those two things, making people more aware of how to reply and more strictly and aggressively using the new definition 
of the International uh, Holocaust Remembrance uh, uh, Alliance. We've got time uh, for just one more question, uh, Adriana. Yes, uh, before I ask uh, the next question to Eugene, uh, I'd like to make a comment. I'm so glad that they mentioned anti-Semitism because this war of words, this demonization of Israel, uh, you say in your essay that it's fed by um, the general public's ignorance of geography and history, but also by anti-Semitism. And I think this is very important for us to highlight. Um, um, I'd like to ask Eugene, well, you know, several governments have rejected the characterization of Israel as an apartheid state and have strongly condemned these reports. Most recently, the government of the Netherlands did so. Uh, do you think that uh, this will ultimately affect the credibility of these organizations? Um, the, these are, or these are, credibility of these organizations is kind of locked in by virtue of their size and self-congratulatory nature and the uh, incestuous relationship they have with, uh, UN, uh, with UN organizations, uh, which rely on them uh, for information and um I think they're too big to fail. That's maybe one of the things they calculated. Um, I don't think uh, anyone's going to go out of business uh, for being uh, too hard on the on the Jews. Uh, I do think it's important that we do point out that uh, you know we need to you know the point of this allegation is to discredit fundamentally discredit to delegitimize Israel, and uh, as Stan suggested, the the people who make this allegation need to be uh, delegitimized. So when you uh, when when you come with such an accusation, you better be right. So then, when very liberal countries like Holland, when some of the most progressive politicians in America, you know, many Democratic congressmen and senators have rejected this, right? That should call Amnesty's credibility into uh, in, into account. And we need to emphasize uh, how, especially in America, how many. Um, Democratic and progressive members of uh, progressive politicians have said that this is just simply not true. I mean, we could also add that uh, Mahmoud uh, Abbas has also said that Israel is not a, a Palestinian state. I'd rather not rely, uh, rely no, not an apartheid state. I'd rather not rely on him, uh, but he, <laughs> he has said it too. Um, and I, I think that needs to be pointed out, uh, pointed out over and, and over again, because otherwise you just have the authority, the sort of unbiased authority. Of, of amnesty. And Netherlands is a country that ha- cares vastly about human rights, uh, and it's very unusual for them to publicly criticize an amnesty uh, report. The UK, many countries have rejected it. I don't know a single country that's actually said, yes, like this is the case. So uh, that, that is important to point out. Well, I want to thank both of you. Next up, actually, the next time we meet, perhaps, is uh, a discussion about the Commission of Inquiry, <clears throat> which was established by the UN Human Rights Council, uh, it has no shelf life. It's open-ended. Um, its uh, purpose is simply to exist, uh, to engage in, in this kind of, uh, of rhetoric <clears throat> using apartheid, hostility toward Israel. It has the staff of, of some 18 people. It um, is headed Uh, The three commissioners are known for their hostility uh, toward Israel. And this yet opens up another uh, avenue uh, of this kind of defamation of Israel and the Jewish state. So we should be on the lookout for that. Their first report is scheduled to be given in June of this year. Uh, But again, with no shelf life, uh, the activity of this particular committee connected to the Human Rights Council, uh, again, is something that we need to be uh, watching very, very closely. Uh, so our thanks again to Eugene Kantorovich and Thane Rosenbaum for joining us and uh, sharing their analysis. And thank you for tuning in to this special conversation with B'nai Brith. If you enjoyed the interview, make sure you catch all of our programs by subscribing to the B'nai Brith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook. And be sure to visit our website, benebrit.org, to learn more about our important work. For my guests, Eugene and Thane and Adriana, thank you for, to my colleague. And for B'nai Brith, I'm Dan Mariashin. Join us again soon.